Beautiful. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, it is 3.05 in Laredo, Texas, where I am calling in from, and I'm really pleased to see so many faces, so many that I haven't even been able to catch up. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing you throughout the course of the next hour and a half. Um, my name is Raquel Leanda. I'm the Minister of Bridge Building at the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture. Um, as many of you probably are already aware of, we are not a federal agency, but rather we're a people-powered department. We're an action network of artists, activists, and allies that are looking to incite creativity and to shape a culture of equity, empathy, and belonging. So I'm really excited to have you guys here today. And I, I wanted to start by naming that in 2017, the US Department of Arts and Culture launched our Honor Native Land Guide. And in that guide, we ask that all individuals and organizations open up public events with an acknowledgement of the traditional native inhabitants of the land. So as part of this gathering today, I'd like to begin by naming that every community owes its existence to generations from around the world. Some were brought to the place you were calling in from against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant, hope, their distant homes and hopes for a better life. And some have lived on the land you are calling in from for more generations than can be counted. And so we at the USDAC believe that truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. So today I continue this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. So I am standing on the ancestral lands of the Coahuilteco and the Carrizo Come Crudo people in Laredo, Texas on the US-Mexico border. I pay my respects to the elders past and present, and I'm asking that we all take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today by placing the name of the, tra of the traditional ancestor pe ancest ancestors of the land you are calling in from to the chat window. If for some reason you don't already know who the traditional ancestors of the land are, we can offer you some guidance. Um, Emily is going to place a map in the chat window and you can click on that and learn a little bit more about where you're from. I'd love to pass the mic to Karen, our co-host from Arts and Democracy to give us a little bit more information. Hi everybody, I'm Karen Atlas. My pronouns are she and her and I'm calling in from Brooklyn, New York, Lenape land. And I invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat box with your name, pronouns, affiliations, where you're calling in from, and the native land that you're on. I direct Arts and Democracy, which helps build a movement of work that cross-fertilizes arts and culture, participatory democracy, and social justice. We grew out of National Voice in 2004, a national campaign to further civic participation in historically disenfranchised communities. We believe that democracy is not a spectator sport and that it needs to be actively cultivated every day, grounded in values of equity and racial justice. We know that culture and art are essential to creating a truly participatory democracy and that transformation happens when people can bring their full selves to their activism. I'm so glad that you've joined us for this conversation. I want to remind you that this is a nonpartisan event. Arts and Democracy, U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, and some of our speakers represent nonprofit organizations. Please do not advocate for or against candidates on this call. Thank you. So some housekeeping items before we start. This event is being recorded. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your video. Please keep yourself muted unless you're presenting. There will be no built-in break during the hour and a half long call, so take care of yourselves as needed. And please excuse any technical glitches. If a participant is being disruptive, we will immediately try to remove them. Our program today will be as follows. We'll start with a panel of presenters speaking for five to seven minutes, and you can put your questions for the speakers in the chat. We've also invited some people to share work briefly for two minutes, and have received requests from some of you to share work as well. And then if there's time at the end, we'll have some brief questions and comments. We invite you to share your resources and upcoming events as we proceed. We'll be gathering them on a shared Google Doc and we are pasting the link to that document in the chat. 
Thank you to the Puffin Foundation for supporting this event, to our panelists, to Tom Asau and Emily Ann Levy for helping organize the call, and to HowlRound for live streaming it. Now I'll introduce uh, and welcome back our facilitator, Raquel Dionda from the USDAC. Thank you, Raquel. Sure, beautiful. Thank you, Karen, I appreciate that. Um, without further ado, I'd love to move into our presentations from our four panelists. We'll be starting with Andrea Asaf, who is representing Art to, Art to Action and H-Town Votes. Andrea, take it away. Hello, everyone. It is so great to be here. Thank you so much to the Arts and to Arts and Democracy and the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture. It's very exciting. Um, so my name is Andrea Asaf. I'm the Artistic Director of Art to Action, which is based in Tampa, Florida. Um, Art to Action is um, primarily a theater and performance organization, although we do a lot of interdisciplinary work creating, developing, producing, and presenting original theater, interdisciplinary performance, and performative acts and progressive cultural organizing. Um, but primarily we support artists of color, women and queer or LGBTQ plus identified artists and creative allies in our work. Um, since 2019, we have been uh, working with Houston in Action. Uh, I've been working closely with them as a consultant and trainer um, initially, we started our relationship um, to offer uh, cultural organizing trainings for their network of um, activists and organizers uh, who are interested in integrating arts and cultural practice more into their organizing strategy. And as the summer erupted, I will say, we shifted to offering uh, racial justice trainings. And um, the executive director, Francis Valdez, who you will meet later in today's call, I'm so glad that Francis is here, um, well, uh, came up with the idea of um, how could, what if we could offer um, some funding to a, a cohort of artists to um, actively partner and, and with um, organizers on the ground and uh, work toward voter engagement and voter mobilization through these partnerships. So um, Houston Action was able to raise money to fund, I mean, initially we thought four uh, projects uh, at $10,000 each, but with additional funding, it turned into 12 projects. Um, eight of them at $10,000 each and four at uh, $5,000 each. And so now we have this incredible network of 12 artists um, that is quite interdisciplinary and includes individual artists, uh, unincorporated collectives, and nonprofit organizations doing um, who have proposed projects, everything from street theater to documentary film, animation, uh, live streamed performance, spoken word, visual art, online game nights, dance videos, comedy, and more. Um, and we are just about to officially announce uh, all of these projects and the, the funded artists. Um, we in anticipate releasing the press release actually tomorrow. Um, so unfortunately, I can't show them to you yet or talk about all of them, but they are mostly Houston-based artists and uh, organizations, but we also have a few national projects in the cohort. And um, they really range in different kinds of models from uh, large one-time live streamed events to daily social media interventions to um, following specific voters or activists on their journey leading up to the elections. Um, all of the projects are nonpartisan. They're focused on voter engagement, education, and mobilization. And we, because of the pandemic, we had to make it a requirement that they had a plan for safety and keeping people safe, uh, safe ways to engage during the pandemic, which means that this cohort is perhaps more heavily digital than, uh, than it might have been in different times. Um, but the, what is key to this model and what we're interested in with this model is really artists and organizers working together, artists partnering with organizing uh, uh, organizations and initiatives. So um, this, this helps everybody, for, for us we think of this as a win-win in so many ways. So from increasing artists' capacity to track metrics and actually understand 
the impact of their work and collect data, which artists so rarely have the capacity and support to do, but they can do that with their organizing partners. To for the organizing partners, increasing their ability to reach uh, communities and voters who have been you know, disenfranchised either historically because they are communities of color, or um, or because or youth who simply. Um, have a lot of questions about the impact of their vote in this time. And so we see artists as key to um, not only engaging people in multiple ways, but actually inspiring them to take action and vote in the upcoming elections. Um, also, Houston Action itself acts as a partner for the artists um, by amplifying the, the work of the artists through their network of over 50 organizing um, organizations throughout Texas, and also um, nationally through social media. So um, a couple of examples we want to uh, lift up. For example, we, there's a documentary filmmaker named Miguel Alvarez, who is working in partnership with Mi Familia Vota Education Fund on a project called Voto 2020. Um, and that project uh, follows a Houston, a young Houston activist uh, in her journey to engage voters. And he's uh, doing really beautiful um, documentary filmmaking work. Um, and a lot of the footage was filmed pre-COVID, uh, so uh, they're in post-production. Um, another great example is um, Riaz Kowali, which is a music ensemble that plays um, Sufi music and they're partnering with Engage Texas, which is an organization that empowers Muslim Americans through political literacy and civic engagement, um, as you well. have one minute remaining. Okay, thank you. As well as um, OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates. So those are just a couple of examples. Um, Art to Action's role is really in designing and facilitating this process, um, offering trainings for the funded artists and um, coaching and consulting and lifting up their work in the, in the arts field and, uh, and beyond through platforms like this. So how do you get involved? I'll just uh, say really quickly, um, look for the press release and formal announcements coming soon. You can follow Houston in Action and Art to Action on social media and follow the hashtag HTownVotes, which I will drop in the chat, as well as on Thursday, this Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, we're doing a whole session called Artists and the Vote with um, the Houston Arts Alliance, Diverse Works, Fresh Arts, Houston Action, and Arts Action, where we'll be doing some case studies on some of the funded projects. So we hope you'll join us for that, and I'll drop the link in the chat, and thank you again so much for having me. Thanks so much, Andrea. There was um, a few questions that came out from people that were really excited and wanted to get some links to your work. So do make sure that you include as many links as possible in the chat for people. And just as a refresher, we're going to be sending out a newsletter after this, a resource newsletter. We'll include this and other information. Um, Amalia, Amalia Deloney, would you like to step up and start next? I am ready and I'm gonna have some help with some slides. So hi everyone, my name is Amalia. I've been watching everyone in the chat and I realized that there's a number of people that I think I last saw in an election call in 2004. So here we all are doing good work 16 years later. Um, I work at a funding intermediary called the Media Democracy Fund. We work at the intersection of the internet and social justice. We're also home to a project I'm gonna talk about today called the Disinfo Defense League and we'll post some links for how you get involved. Um, next slide. So Disinfo Defense League was conceived um, as a project that was meant to address what we're calling racialized disinfo. And by racialized disinfo, we're really talking about um, tactical, strategic, <clears throat> in, in many ways, very um, intentionally uh, strategic ways that race and ethnic identities are used um, as either a wedge issue or to falsify information um, to spread disinformation. We know these tactics were used in 2016 and Disinfo Defense League was really um, developed to be able to build the capacity of groups to identify disinfo and inoculate against it in this upcoming election. Uh, next slide. So we call ourselves a league because really, really we're a rapid response network um, and we're specifically looking at 
disrupting the coordinated disinformation that's directed at Black and Latinx communities, Afro-Latinx communities as well. That's not to say that we're not, um, we're available for all communities of color, but we know that these two communities in particular are being surgically targeted um, to, to do what we call voter depression. Um, some people call it voter suppression, we call it voter depression, so depress the votes. And we work nationally across geography, gender, um, and generation to really build the capacity for leaders and organizations to have the tools and the training and the skills they need to be able to actively combat racialized disinfo in their communities. Next slide. So if you join the league, which is free, and any of you are um, welcome to join, and hopefully my colleague Suhair will post some links, you will get invited into an online community. Like many people, the project started um, pre-COVID and we imagined that all of this training, all of this community building would happen in real life all across the country and then COVID hit. So we had to recalibrate, um, but we have a really incredible online community with hundreds of individuals um, that takes place in sort of a listserv function where you can have access to all kinds of things. So we have weekly reports that help prepare communities for what's coming. We have SMS or text-based classes that let people know what disinformation is over the course of two weeks in Spanish or English. We have clinics where you can work with um, experts on disinformation messaging um, or, or um, inoculation efforts. We also have places where you can workshop ideas with other people on the ground who are fighting disinfo in their communities. And what makes us different than a lot of projects is the, is the focus on race, is putting race um, forward and understanding that communities of color have leadership um, that come from comms and research and organizing, and that we understand how culture um, is, you know, is, a, is a tool for change and that culture in so many ways has been weaponized by disinformation um, folks. And so we really want to, to embed um, or we want to really address the issue of culture and identity in our work and, and provide people with technical assistance and resources and resource providers who come from the communities who are most directly uh, targeted. Next slide. So who is the league? Right now we have 174 organizations from across the country who are working with us, three, over 300 members. Uh, and the vast majority of which are folks of color who really come out of racial justice, gender justice, um, community organizing, climate change backgrounds. So these are folks who, who are doing community building work, social change work um, in, their, in their communities and understand that in order to win, they really have to combat this new world of disinformation um, that is putting harmful and uh, harmful, malicious, and, and lies into their community. Whether it's, you know, telling people that COVID started with migrant caravans moving north, um, or telling other communities that 5G towers in their neighborhoods that provide internet access while people are trying to go to school online is another way that COVID, COVID is spread, right? Like these tools um, and this kind of disinformation that's out there is really wrapped in culture and identity and race as a way to target specific communities. Next slide. Oops, we lost the slides, Emily. Oh, there you go. So, you know, why am I on this panel? You know, it's because our work is really cultural work, right? So we can call it disinformation, we can talk about technology, um, but as Malcolm taught us so many years ago, we know that culture is a weapon. Uh, we know right now that culture is being weaponized um, to create info wars that our communities have to address. But we also know that if we reclaim culture and identity, culture is a powerful tool that we can use to inoculate disinfo. And so we really see the work we're doing at, um, in the Disinfo Defense League as cultural work. Next slide. You know, and why is it cultural work? Um, because disinfo thrives on personal relationships. It requires personal relationships, right? The way disinfo is spread is because the person who told you the disinfo, whether it came off of Facebook or Twitter um, or TikTok or, or you know, WhatsApp, the person who you're talking to about that information is someone that you have a proximate relationship to. And so that means that the most important disinfo inoculation efforts um, really take place at the hyper-local level with trusted messengers. 
And we know that in communities of color, we've always had trusted knowledge holders. We've always had specific cultural channels that we're working with. And so we're working to build up and equip the knowledge of folks who are working in these areas, right? So that means a, dis a disinfo inoculator, you know, um, is, is going to be as powerful at a, a quinceanera or tamalada or nail shop um, as they are, you know, on bigger platforms and news stations. You have one minute remaining. Perfect. Uh, last slide. So we'd love you to join the project. We have a sign up here. And again, you'll see it in the chat. Um, but join us. There is a full list of activities that are going to be happening throughout October, really preparing people for the election. Um, all of our work is nonpartisan. So, so please sign up and we'll hope to see you um, in the league. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amalia. Hopefully you will get many more disinfo inoculators from this call. Um, love that title. Uh, Trapania Bonner will be our next panelist. Um, Trapania represents the Crescent City Media Group and Louisiana Counts 2020. Hi, right, thanks again. Um, again, Trapania Bonner, Crescent City Media Group, Center for Civic Action. Um, and what I didn't mention um, to my to the team coordinating the call is that um, this this Louisiana Counts campaign is a part of a larger project called the Revolutionary Census and Redistricting Initiative, right? And it's based on the, the 1870 census, which was the first post-slave census, and 1871, um, the first uh, post-slave redistricting process, um, where African American, well, actually, people of color were able to form for the first time majority minority districts. Uh, one of which I still reside in till this day, uh, Congressional District 2, which is Cedric Richmond's district. Um, and so the campaign um, is a part of a, a regional project called South Counts 2020. I'm the anchor here in Louisiana, um, and we support um, the South Count strategy by providing communications and toolkits. Um, for the sake of this call, I'll, I'll try to tailor this conversation to talk a little bit about Louisiana Counts 2020, our organizing tools, our organizing strategy, and our digital, digital strategy leading into uh, COVID-19 and pandemic um, um, opportunities. And so um, then the last thing is obviously um, non-response follow-up um, as we're advocating for the extension, the original extension of October 31st. Uh, and so the campaign is our statewide census education campaign um, and our organizing tools. We primarily leverage media as an organizing tool. I'm a filmmaker by trade, activist at heart, and through Crescent City Media Group, I'm able to basically live out my wildest um, organizing dreams. Um, but um, so, so we use media as an organizing tool um, to educate community stakeholders, to increase awareness, and also to support advocacy. Our organizing strategy um, went like this. We coordinated our census events to promote and provide access to census jobs. Uh, part of that strategy um, was to um, allow community stakeholders to take advantage of counting their counting within their own communities, right? Um, something we experienced on the Gulf Coast post Katrina was um, because people were displaced all over the country, um, many people from different parts of the region had to fly in and support canvassing during our census, um, during our census time, right? And so many of those folks didn't know the difference between a blighted home or a home that was under construction, right? So we we lost count in a lot of ways. And so we find it that found that it was important for residents within our communities to take part in this count. Who knows our communities better than those who reside there, right? And so hosting those census events early in, uh, in the fall of 2019 allowed for us to create, um, to, to organize job fairs for folks to have access to those jobs, but also to combine our efforts of get out the vote and get out the count, right? Usually at our events, you would have a laptop set up for you to apply for your jobs online and also to register to vote online as we have online voter registration in Louisiana. Um, those efforts also um, allowed us to eventually during COVID um, push to um, have folks fill out their forms online. And so we hosted uh, a get out the form, get out the, uh, get out the count, fill out your form Zoom party, uh, which was crazy uh, to try to get that many, as many people that join our call, which is 195 people. Um, we hosted two week, two calls within that one day, a morning call and an evening call. Um, and they both went really well, uh, to my surprise, actually. I didn't think people would join our call to fill out a census form, right? 
um, but they did. Uh, we had public health advocates on the line to share information about COVID-19. We had partnership specialists to walk community stakeholders, stakeholders through the process of filling out their census forms. Um, and it was a successful event, which allowed us to gain um, some earned media through USA Today and our local papers. Um, one of the slides um, that um, I wanted Tom to share was the slide where um, there was, uh, and I forgot to say, put up the slides, Tom, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> One, one of the slides, you could see a picture of Michelle Obama because she was a part of that article. Um, I, did, I was not in a picture of Michelle Obama, that would have been great, uh, but her photo was there and my name was right above it. So I thought that was really cool. But anyway, uh, we received some iron media um, for the cause uh, and to promote the census across the region to our partners who were part of this effort as well. SIP Culture in Mississippi, Spirit House in North Carolina, um, Project South in Atlanta, um, et cetera. There's another great group um, in Dallas as well, working with um, the city of Dallas for Dallas Counts 2020. All who are part of South Counts all contributed to making that call a great success. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight, um, if we can go to um, the last slide, Tom, um, which is this effort to um, remind folks that the census process is a part of our electoral process, right? When we are counted within our districts, um, we, we're able to um, um, vote for candidates of our choice or run for office within our communities, right? So that count does allow us the opportunity um, to be seen within our districts and also to allow our tax dollars to flow within those districts uh, to provide resources to our many efforts in terms of infrastructure projects. And so we just remind folks that the census is a part of our electoral process as well. Um, if, if Tom could go to slide two, I want to show you, share with you guys uh, just some of the uh, what our toolkits look like uh, when we present those to our community stakeholders. And we present this as our statewide um, um, infographic. And we had sort of uh, individualized municipal graphics as well. Um, we were able to do um, provide scorecards to municipalities based on whether or not they had access to uh, internet or not, right? And so if, if New Orleans received the C minus, um, we do have a number of residents with access to computers, but not access to Wi-Fi, right? And so we saw what we needed to increase efforts there, and we were happy to see Verizon and local cable companies step up. Um, they did not um, hear our cry to provide free um, access to internet on National Census Day and throughout that week, uh, because we know that would help to increase the count in our areas. Um, you have lastly, one minute remaining. Great. Um, and, and Tom, could you go to the next slide? And I'll just leave that slide up. No, I'm the one following that. Um, and I'll just leave that slide up as we, we know for a fact that census does provide, it doesn't put money into our pockets, but provide, but pours money within our districts to support infrastructure projects, whether it's um, healthcare or schools, uh, mutual aid centers, as many folks are, are, are really building those centers across the region at this point, housing, et cetera. And so, um, but, but, but the primary thing we want folks to, fo folks to focus on at this point is non-response follow-up. And the fact that the Bureau has moved the, um, the deadline for NRFU up to September 30th, as opposed to October 31st. We know this was a push uh, by the president um, to uh, pressure the census director to not only move up the, the deadline, but also to um, follow what he thinks is the president's cry to limit immigrant or undocumented access to the census. We know that everyone within the bounds of, of the state of the country must be counted, whether you're undocumented or not. And so we're working closely with our partners within the immigrant community to address this issue. And a number of lawsuits have been filed as well um, to combat this and to support that and to push that original deadline back to October 31st. I'll yield there for folks who want to learn more about the campaign or the work. Um, I'll place the website in the chat or you can visit www.the-mediagroup.us. Beautiful. Thank you, Trapania, for sharing so eloquently on this very important work. Appreciate it. Um, Savannah Romero from Illuminative will be presenting next. We have two speakers left. Savannah? Go ahead. Great, can you all see my screen? Awesome. 
All right, Hans Zansi can bet you. My name is Savannah Romero. I am the Partnerships and Programs Manager with Illuminative. I am also Eastern Shoshone from the Wind River Reservation. I will start with giving some quick background information on Illuminative. Um, so Illuminative really grew out of uh, this Reclaiming Native Truth report in 2018. Um, sorry, trying to find this. Advance to the next slide. There we go. Um, the, the key findings for the Reclaiming Native Truth report included that 72% of Americans almost never encounter or seek out information about Native Americans. 87% of state history standards don't mention Native American history after the 1900s. 27 states make no mention of a single Native American in K through 12 curriculum. Native American characters only make up between 0 and 0.04% of primetime TV and film. And lastly, less than 0.3% of philanthropic resources go to Native American people and organizations. The report concluded that the profound invisibility of Native peoples in contemporary society coupled with toxic misconceptions perpetuated by pop culture, media, and K-12 education fuels bias and racism against Native Americans, concluding that systemic erasure is the way that modern day racism um, manifests, against, manifests against Native people. So Illuminative was created to address this. Um, as a national racial justice Native-led organization, our mission is to build power for um, Native people by amplifying contemporary Native voices, stories, and issues to advance justice, equity, and self-determination. I'll briefly discuss our Indigenous Future Survey results that um, we will be releasing next week because it informs our voter engagement strategy. So in partnership with um, our Native-led research team at the University of Michigan, Native Organizers Alliance, and the Center for Native American Youth, Illuminative organized the largest survey of Native peoples ever conducted. With 6,278 Native adult participants across the country, the survey is the first step in a years-long process to understand the motivations, priorities, and changing demographics and beliefs of our community. Among important information about voting, voting behavior, and political engagement, the Indigenous Future Survey revealed that COVID-19 is having a devastating impact on Native communities, and that addressing mental health, violence against women, children, and LGBTQ plus individuals, and access to quality and affordable health care are among the most urgent priorities for Native people. I say all of this to highlight that the issues Native peoples care about most are all on the ballot in this election, and we're using this data to create community-specific calls to action in order to mobilize the Native vote. So the um, 2020 election is taking place at a time when the grassroots political power of Native people is rising. In 2018, there was a record-setting number of Native candidates, including a historic number of Native women running for political office. The election of two, the first two Native women to Congress, Congresswoman Holland and Davids, that year affirmed that the power of the Native, uh, affirmed the power of the Native vote. In addition, there's a new level of awareness of the importance and potential impact of engaged Native electorate, especially in swing states. Um, with large Native populations, including Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada, and Minnesota. However, despite the growth of Native civic engagement and political power, 34% of the total Native population is not registered to vote, and the turnout rate for voters is between 5 and 14% lower than other racial groups. Illuminative believes that to empower our people to take civic action, we must see our issues, aspirations, culture, and future as connected to the political process. Which leads me to our, our electoral strategy. So our electoral strategy is twofold. First, we've been working with Harness, the Center for Cultural Power, and the League as one of the four anchor organizations in Culture Surge. A coalition of more than two dozen leading cultural strategy organizations, cultural strategists, and social justice artists to develop and activate cultural co content that sparks a massive wave of voter engagement in historically disenfranchised communities. Second, Illuminative is partner partnering with Native Organizers Alliance to create Natives Vote, 
a national campaign bringing together Native artists and storytellers with grassroots communities, organizers, and influencers to increase Native voter registration and mobilize a historic voter turnout across Indian country. Our overarching, overarching call to action is one, register to vote, and two, make a a voting plan via mask or mail. We're partnering with Native artists and storytellers to create content informed by the priorities identified in the Indigenous Future Survey in order to inspire and mobilize the Native vote. On the slide, you can see examples of the creative content we've already commissioned. Our campaign will be launching this Wednesday with the launch of our website and, our, um, and next Wednesday during National Voter Registration Day we'll be hosting a national town hall on Facebook Live to kick off the campaign. Lastly, I wanna close by um, saying that as we face the election of a lifetime, it's imperative that Native people's perspectives and issues are present in the conversations about the future of this country. The recognition and inclusion of Native peoples and the recognition of our inherent moral and legal rights as sovereign nations are key to building a more inclusive and representative democracy. And our collective ancestral knowledge as a community will ensure a safer future for us all. Thank you and please um, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, subscribe to our mailing list on the nativesvote2020.com website once it goes live on Wednesday and I will add the resources in the document and the chat. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Savannah. Um, all incredible information. Everybody just keep, continue remembering to place any resources or information you have in the chat window. We're really looking forward to compiling the resource guide for everybody after this call. So our last speaker today, before opening it up to the floor, we have um, more than 10 people already signed up to share is Dr. Rob Biko Baker. Uh, Rob, would you like to start? How are y'all doing? Uh, my name is Biko. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to get on a call with you all today. Such an important topic. We're Seems like every four years, the most important election of our lifetime, but I, I feel this one in my bones. Uh, so just a little bit of background on my, about myself. I am a for, the former executive director of the League of Young Voters. I spent most of my 20s and far too much of my 30s uh, sort of spending uh, time organizing. And in the evenings, I was working with hip hop artists and writing for hip hop magazines. And oof. I've known Karen for a long time. We actually, and I saw Yossi's on this call too. Oh man, we did some stuff, y'all. So a little bit about uh, where we're at. We, I was, in 2016, I started this firm, for, firm called Render. It's a digital storytelling firm. You know, we do great design. We do, we can do some technology. We can do some film production, but really we're a storytelling firm. And that's so important because storytelling uh, is, we, everybody knows all the data that tells you that we're inspired by storytelling, but storytelling is our strategy. And so that's what we try to do. And, you know, I've known this for a long time, but over the last four or five, six years, I really believe that the new American majority is the key to the future. I might not get there with them, but I'm going to try to my mo the most that I could do to get them there. And uh, y'all know who the new American majority is, but I especially be believe that black women have such an important role in this situation. And my firm, most of my clients are women of color. I was referred by women of color. So this is such an important uh, part of our community that's never going anywhere. Some of our clients, you know, uh, we've worked with, you know, our Nasa Troutman, who some of you may know, and, and uh, Calvin Williams with the Big We. We've also worked Ava DuVernay's uh, nonprofit film organization called Array. Um, and, We've also did a big project with uh, my longtime comrades, Casmer Agency. We actually started a joint venture called Get Louder. We work with big epic brands who are trying to bring uh, social change through brand awareness. And as you know, uh, young people, millennials, Gen Zs, and even uh, Gen X are very much brand aware people. Some of the big projects we worked on, we did a social, uh, a cultural competency uh, project with Warner Brothers' new film, uh, Ryan Coogler's new film. I'm probably not supposed to talk about this, so I should not put that in there. Next one 
is uh, we actually co-produced a film called Stranger Fruit with a, a filmmaker, a white, a white guy who went to Ferguson and told the story of Mike Brown's family. This is actually in Stars, and then we're, we're helping women of color, such as director named Jade Sharon, UCLA student, produce films with the British Virgin Islands. And last thing, but we're still grassroots. I'm still Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm always going to be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I still live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so a lot of our efforts is lifting up grassroots superheroes at the grassroots and local level. And so we, we have illustrators and comic book uh, writers who are uh, cap, uh, personifying, you know, people like Gwen Moore, who everybody, everyone loves. Rika Tyler from St. Louis, who's a Ferguson protest hero, 23 is a hero. And then Frank Nitty, who just uh, walked across the country, uh, man, to DC from Milwaukee. So because of our network, you know, we, 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 we were night, we, we unite millions, you know, and we're loud. We're not afraid of this. This is what we need to be doing. And uh, have people on my team, you know, we have lots and lots of experience at the intersection of digital and social justice. So we sort of understand how this works. You know, some people go online like, we're going to make it viral. And it's like, nah, you know, and, you know, when I was a civic engagement organizer, these tactics live true online. And it's like, you got to meet them where they live. How are they communicating? What lights them up? And, you know, we're, this isn't like a cyclical thing. You know, we're not just talking about civic engagement. We have clients that are working on civic engagement projects, but we also might be in a studio with Business Boy or K-Camp and, and uh, Future. So how we generate awareness. Our approach flips media on its head. We use experience online, offline, or both to pull voters into engagement. If the content isn't legit to the core community, if the content is legit to the core community, they share it, creating a movement on social media. This impacts culture. And so many people are coming to us to do paid media, and that's great. We love paid media, but the best things are organic. And so many artists on here know that, and we try to create the, the, the ecosystem so that we can make things blow up. Okay, this is a bragging slide. I'm gonna get through that. Push through that. People influence people. You know, we, you know, Jacob Lattimore, young man who's on the television show, Showtime The Shy. He's been on that show for some years now. He's also done a lot of great projects, R&B, major label. He first started doing events with us when he was eight years old. And I could go up and knock every door of every 25-year-old woman voter in the city of my, uh, the city in which I live. But if we can get Jacob on IG with a young lady who's also making a record, light up. And we've done that time and time again. This is just the analysis of New American the Majority. I don't know if anybody else has done this or looked at this, but, you know, people are always looking for uh, young or, you know, the working class white folks, you know, the, the white voters of old, the, the, the traditional democratic voter. But the reality is you can't find them because they don't exist. The future is brown, you know? The future is brown, they just don't exist anymore. And that's not a, a knock, but it's like trying to sell a, a product to people who aren't there. And the world, America, has to realize that the future is going to be brown. It will be brown and that's beautiful. It's so much potential and opportunity that's there. And, you know, I, I, I got a PhD and focus on data and social change through statistics just to show people that this is the future and they still don't believe me y'all. So sorry. I'm, I don't know. I'm going to spend a lot of money on people that don't exist. Hopefully you have one minute remaining. So this, this slide is a little bit uh, dated, but we are the grassroots, you know, we're, we're in the communities where tr traditional people don't like to go. And we're there because culture is there and that's where the hottest artists the music and creative will be and you know in, until i die i hope to stay hip and stay around hip people who can play dope music and great great graphics awesome thank you biko much appreciated and beautiful slideshow pops um so we have uh 
as I mentioned, many people signed up to um, share short two minute pitches of projects that they're working on locally. But before we do that, I'd love to just open up space for some questions or comments for this super rich content that was just shared. Um, we can make 10 minutes for it. It's uh, 3.50 now or where I live. But so um, at four o'clock, we can move on to open up to that queue. Any hand raises or questions in the chat that would like to be shared? I'll, um, I'm going to give it a, a, a minute or so. I actually have a question for you guys that came up for me. I've been um, recently working on building out a strategy to um, engage voters along the, the border region from California to Texas. And um, as I think many of you know, the young Latino voter is a really important voter in this election. Um, and one thing that we keep like wrapping our heads, trying to wrap our heads around is like, where that's not me, you know, <laughs> um, I'm not that young voter. Um, I don't know how TikTok works. So um, what do you guys do in terms of really trying to think about and to, to attract that young voter, whether it be for voting or for um, getting their information on the census? Uh, I'll jump in and say that actually one of the H-Town Votes artists, um, they actually do plan on using TikTok. Um, that's Mecca, uh, which Mecca, which stands for, oh, uh, Multicultural Education and Counseling Through the Arts in, um, in Houston. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, one of the intentions of H-Town Votes was, um, was to engage youth. And so artists are taking a lot of different approaches uh, to that, you'll hear from Christina Wong in just a little bit about how she's working with youth. But um, I think social media plays really a, a really, really important role, perhaps bigger than ever in this election and in reaching um, youth who spend a lot of time there. The more creative we can get. I, I noticed that um, an artist called Tofu Riot, is, uh, who's also one of the H-Town Votes artists, is on the call, um, going to be doing animation through Instagram. Uh, and social media interventions on, on a weekly, if not daily basis. So, um, I, and, you know, some people are more old school, like live uh, spoken word, poetry, um, different kinds, different, I think it's important that we use any and all tools and methodologies and approaches to creatively engaging youth voters uh, this year. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I, you know, we got some really quick responses, which is basically, we hire young people, which I think is a really solid, obvious um, go-to. So thank you for naming that. And, and also, I'm seeing that marchforourlives.com has local chapters with lots of artists who are really riding hard this election. Um, so I'm, no, I'm going to be checking out marchforourlives.com. Um, any other thoughts on that question around the young voter? Just inclusion in the process, long before um, voting season, um, we have to engage young folks in the, to be a part of the process um, and include it in the scaffolding as, it, as we begin to build strategies to move forward. Um, they take ownership and agency when they have it. Um, we saw that when we produced early on um, census films with the, um, the young folks at a local elementary school Kip Morial School, and um, they were awesome, and they were as informed. They were so informed, we didn't have to do our whole educational spill. Um, their teachers and their parents already had them sort of prepped. Um, what we needed to do is provide them with an opportunity to amplify um, their voices and to support the overall cause. Great. Thanks, Trapania. Um, any other questions? We have a question from Galaxy J7 Crown, I believe. Um, Are you there? I saw you raise your hand, so. Is, the, yeah, is it? You, you no. with the Augustan, Augustana University shirt. <laughs> awesome. Yes, that's me. Uh, yeah. I've been sitting here watching and listening as much as I could. I 
building up my own little art studio here. Um, I am out in the Midwest and I have started and founded a little thing called Midwest Immersive Artists Collective. And we are struggling to find ways of connecting with the community uh, because, you know, being a person of color in a, in a community that is just kind of now getting open to that, where does a person start and what kind of community you guys have where, you know, somebody like me just trying to jump into it and bring this kind of information, you know, inspire young voters, inspire people to get involved with all of the community activities and, um, and outreaches. What is a good place for someone like me to start? Well, I don't, I don't know much about your story, but uh, I, I'm in the Midwest and you didn't have to say much, but I understood what you were saying. Uh, so, you know, I really encourage you just to, uh, to believe in yourself. I know that uh, for a long time, I, I, I've struggled with imposter syndrome and like my beliefs aren't right. And my, my creative vision isn't right. Mm -hmm. I did that for a long time. And so I really believe that if you believe in yourself and, you know, you're also vulnerable, you know, as a creative or as a leader, you can get to your purpose. Appreciate that. Thank also to providing a space for folks to learn more about what opportunities they may have working with you um, and a sort of shared opportunity um, to that end, um, which, which is difficult during the quarantine. Um, yeah. but, um, but Boom also provides some opportunities to sort of link folks and to form sort of a light working group or coalition uh, around the work that you're attempting to do. Yeah, I just also add, you know, when you work with a value of intergenerational leadership, these questions about how you include youth or any other age group, you know, are less, they're less of a, a knee jerk reaction because it's a value um, that different ages and different perspectives make your work stronger. And I think, you know, this anytime you're doing critical work is an important, you, you always have time to hit pause and ask yourself what new principles and values you want to bring in to center your work and a commitment to intergenerational leadership um, is important. Um, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Emily, do you uh, see the hands raised that I'm not seeing? Hi. Hi. Um, I think I was after the Galaxy guy. Go for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, am I wrong? <laughs> um, I don't see my hand raised anymore, so I assume that it's me. So I think I went after Galaxy, 7, Galaxy J7. Um, my name is Shree Mitchell. I actually organized uh, uh, on the ground with an a organization called Stop on Violence Against Women, and we're particularly focused on um, digital vote suppression going into the last 50 days. Um, and so my question is, as much as we want to talk about youth and understanding um, youth impact in terms of how they use social media and the like, um, how much work is being done on how much they might be spreading or understand disinformation around the election and its impact? Andrew, what any of you are doing about it, if, if at all? Well, I don't want to be jump first again, but it was getting a little uncomfortable. So, but, uh, you know, um, there's, there's huge efforts by foreign countries and other nation states to change and alter our narrative and really weaken the civic engagement process in our country. I've seen that firsthand and I've seen it uh, in a way that these ads and pop things that pop up on social media and we're not even close to being ready for the amount of disinformation that's there. In fact, I, I've had people that have formerly worked for me in recent weeks sharing memes that say like, you know, if we can stand in, in line uh, during the holidays, we can stand in line to get our vote, basically trying to weaken absentee ballot and vote and vote by mail. And it's because these, these messages are being forced down our throat through content farms. And I really am worried about 
our side of the game still not understanding how important stories are to shaping up the way that we act as humans. Do you have counter narratives? I mean, you're the media guy. Well, I have a lot of counter narratives now. If you give me time, I give you like 17 pitch decks, some mood boards, some, you know, some treatments. So I, we have a lot of stuff on, on display. Right now we have about 30 clients and have a lot of ideas on what we're even doing right now. We're shooting a short film. We're going production this weekend. You know, uh, it's, it's a trick or vote. Everybody's involved with trick or vote, but it's like a horror story where we're trying to convince millennials and Gen Zs that actually the vote is a, a value. And hopefully if you see this film, you can share it with the people in your network. Thank you. Anybody else on this topic? Yes, uh, my name is Nancy. I'm from San Diego. I have uh, just encouraged um, artists and the community members about social media um it's a great somebody mentioned it's a great way to really connect it with others and then but just by posting something positive like i am doing my own personal projects right now like i'm creating art and putting it every day like a image every day you're saying like you know why it's important and 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 the reasons and i create links that they're like with great information with the information that's valid because sometimes we just have like seven seconds to see this information and we depend on that information. And just remember guys that, that social media is not, it's not, it's not your, for people to really depend on that information. Do you need, it's the starting point. And from then you need to really research more information. Yeah, thanks Nanzi and Shireen. I, I agree. I think that's a really good question and something to ponder if folks have ideas on how to challenge that disinfo with um, the young voter, please share it. I'm seeing other information in the chat from people like Penn, who's going to present soon, and One Hood Media. We're definitely consolidating all that, inf inf all that info in the chat for our resource newsletter. Um, we're sort of out, on out of time, but I also I want to give space to Garrett, who had a hand up, and then we'll switch to the stack of presenters. Garrett? Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. good. Um, I was curious about like, um, this is like a nonpartisan uh, uh, effort. Um, is that, uh, you know, I, I kind of forget my question anymore, but I was, I just liked the fact that it was nonpartisan, which is something that's like totally different from, uh, everything else that's just bipartisan. Like our whole voting system seems like it's just overrun by bipartisan uh, propaganda, like either Democrat or Republican. And every election comes to the same thing. Um, and I just thought it was really cool how like uh, this, this uh, group or session is not like biased in any way um is there a way that we can like promote th that further in our political system like this non-biased uh information i guess or non-biased uh non-partisan voting platform or voting do you know what i mean like um encourage i don't know Sorry, I I wish I could ask this question better, but I I'm trying here. Um, yeah, does anybody else have can add on that? Maybe. Sure. You know, there was um, uh, Francis Valdez mentioned the need to really center the work on community rather than parties, which I think is is really important and integral to. Um, the work of USDAC and the work of um, arts and democracy. And I'm curious if other people have thoughts. I know Sonia Baez Hernandez also mentioned wanting to um, speak to that a little bit. And if anybody else has thoughts, by all means, before we move to the stack. Something, I just wanted to share with you uh, one strategic that, uh, for example, was used here in Florida and they were interviewing people from the community and then some of the question is why people have people why people need to vote 
And then I was one of, at least I was, as an artist, I was, you know, I was interviewed. And I think that um, sometimes I think that if we think that then we can interview artists, people from the community, and then we basically populate a lot of voices coming from different point of view of why we need to vote. I think basically I selected three issues. One was against police brutality, climate change, and the detention center. At least for me, for me, that was an important element of why we need to go and vote. But I think then uh, for me, that is a way of listening people, the voice from the community, the voice from the artists, and then basically was recorded on a phone. And then it was there in Facebook. I still there, maybe I should promote it more. But I think it's something that I feel that, uh, you know, also have people from different color, from different social class talking about this is really fundamental because I don't think that we can control the dominant narrative the, because you know it's a, it's a disparity in the resources then that the community have versus what the power people in power have so i think that we can activate those sectors too as well great thank you so much sonia um so i appreciate everybody's sharing um and openness to listen and be a part of this conversation um I now would like to just move to the next phase where we're going to be listening from other people who've shared some information um, or shared excitement and enthusiasm. So um, I am going to move Lisa Gold to the top because I know that Lisa, you need to hop off in a little bit. Lisa Gold from the Asian American Arts Alliance, followed by Lauren Kunis from the National Voter Registration Day, and then Yossi Sargent from Go Vote. So just heads up, those are the next three on stack. Lisa? Thank you so much. It's so nice to see you, Raquel. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Gold. I'm the executive director of the Asian American Arts Alliance, or A4. Um, I'm a mixed race woman of a certain age with my hair very dark, pulled back into a bun. I'm wearing a black sleeveless blouse and I'm seated against um, a backdrop of varied various artworks on a brick wall. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Raquel and Karen and everybody at Arts and Democracy and the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture to allow me just to say a few words about A4 and um, our upcoming town hall event. So we are a 36-year-old Brooklyn-based um, artist service organization dedicated to ensuring greater representation and equity and opportunities for Asian American artists and cultural organizations. And we have a lot of programs that promote conversations around identity and we offer professional development workshops and um, other events that offer pathways of access to cultural gatekeepers and we bring together the community and try to uplift um, the work of our constituents. And one of the many programs that we do, and we've been doing it for 10 years, um, is called Town Hall. And it is a bi-monthly event where we invite members of the community, poets, filmmakers, dancers, musicians, and all artists of all disciplines um, to talk about their work and to learn about other creative pro projects and events that are happening in the community or to ask for support or collaborators um, and just to network with other Asian American creators and get inspiration. So um, coming up next week, next Tuesday, on September 22nd at 6.30 Eastern Time. Um, we're gonna be presenting our September Town Hall event. And the theme of that is arts and civic engagement. So we are gonna have two featured presenters. The format of this is that we have two um, featured presenters that give about 10 minute pitches, projects. And then we have about 25 to 30 people that get up kind of like pitch Petra Kucha slam style and give like a one minute pitch about their projects with video and other discussion. So um, our two featured presenters. Next please wrap to up. Thank you. It's been two minutes. Just oh, sorry. please wrap up. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, just um, Michelle Wu from um, For Freedoms is going to be speaking and Ariel Estrada from um, One Step for Democracy. So I hope you will join us on uh, next Tuesday. I'm going to drop the link into the um, into the chat. So I hope you will sign up and join us. It's free to participate. And um, I would love to hear more about all of your projects. I know all of our constituents would love to know more about what you're doing too. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Much appreciated. It's good to see New York for a minute. Um, Lauren Kunis from the National Voter Registration Day. 
Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I think there was a slide that someone was gonna share. If not, I can yes, just- Yes, I'll pull that up. Awesome, thank you. I will dive right in in the meantime. Um, so National Voter Registration Day is a nonpartisan civic holiday. It's held every year and this year it's going to be, as you can see, on September 22nd, 2020. Um, sorry, so, uh, the holiday was started because one in four eligible Americans is not registered to vote, and those numbers are even higher for youth and communities of color. So our goal is to change that and get every eligible American registered and ready to have a voice in our political system. Um, the holiday is a coordinated day of action taking place next Tuesday. It involves thousands of partners of all stripes and sizes, uh, nonprofits, libraries, co-ops, businesses, digital flat platforms, media companies, and more. Um, this year, they'll be holding in-person voter registration drives in a COVID-conscious way, as well as doing virtual activations on Zoom, using social media, sending email blasts, um, all with calls to register to vote today before it's too late. Um, voter registrations, as some of you may know, are way, way down because of COVID. Um, we estimate that we lost about 2 million new voter registrations per month when social distancing first went into effect and DMVs closed and in-person drives on campuses, at concerts, at farmers markets uh, were put on hold. Two thirds of states require you to register ahead of election day if you wanna vote at all. Um, so we've really got a lot of ground to make up for and a shrinking window of time in which to do so. The first state deadlines are coming up on October 5th, I believe. Um, the good news is it's not too late to get involved with National Voter Registration Day. I see Karen just sent the link to our website around in the chat. Um, I encourage all of you to get involved, whether or not you're an organization or an individual. Um, organizations can sign up as an official holiday partner on our website. It's totally free. It takes two minutes. Um, all that requi is required is you give it your best shot to get voters in your community registered um, in a nonpartisan way, of course, on September 22nd. So again, this could be in person, virtual calls to action. Um, the partner organization toolkit on our website has ready-made social media graphics and posts, emails you can send, a step-by-step -step guide to holding a voter registration drive. Um, I just can't stress enough, it needs to be all hands on deck to get voters registered this year. If we wanna have record setting turnout in November, we need record setting voter registration right now. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to share. Again, our website is there. You can contact me at lauren at nationalvoterregistrationday.org or uh, send to our general account and someone will get back to you. Thanks, Lauren. Much appreciated. Very thank important you. work. Um, Yossi, you're up. Um, get to the share one second. Nice fist. Um, I'm going to do this whole screen share thing. Hold on. Um, well, it's not letting me, so I'm just going to, um, oh, here we go. Never mind. Uh, never mind. Okay. So, um, you'll see if you'd like, we can skip to somebody else and come back to you if it's just, that would be awesome. Can you do that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so, Nor uh, Nora Benavides, are you ready? If not, we can skip to Joan Lipkin. Born ready. Here I am. Um, oh. Thank <laughs> oh, go ahead, oh. Josie. <laughs> so sorry. I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> it yeah, looks it, beautiful. It, things happen. Things <laughs> happen. Okay. Um, uh, Coming back to that, <laughs> my name is Yossi Sergeant. I uh, run an organization called Task Force. Um, I am um, a, a little thrown off, so sorry about that. Um, we started something about six months ago called uh, the, uh, the Into Action Lab. Basically, we want to give people the tools and resources they need to advocate on their own behalf. Um, so we've been cranking out. We've made over 5,000 GIFs and memes. Uh, they're all unbranded and offered for free. Um, we have organically been uploading them to the repositories that fuel social media. That's Giphy, GifCat, Tenor. Um, people don't know this, but Giphy is the second largest search engine in the world after Google. Um, put this into context. That's a B, 27 billion views. So scale. Um, this is what it looks like.
and we touch on every subject matter. We've been partnered with over 100 organizations, asking them to help inform the content, sending us messaging, sending us um, timely issues, things that are happening in the, con um, in the context of now, and things that will remain evergreen and live on for use across social media. When you use the GIF search function and your direct one-to-one -one text in your WhatsApp, when you try to stick a sticker on Instagram and Snapchat and Insta Stories, this is the, um, these are the repositories that fuel those. This is what it looks like across the education election. This is what it looks like local. We can add, we can get extremely local. We can get, go to city names, sports, universities. When people go online, they search for things that are relevant to them. Either you show up on their feed or you don't. Somebody else is putting things on there that, they, that is showing up on their feed. So either you're informing that process or you're not informing that process. We wanted to jump into that process. Your time um, is up. Right, I'm on the two seconds, one slide. Okay. Um, and we have memes and the memes are funny and you can use them. There's census, there's all the issues that we were just talking about. Also, we're producing 200 um, live in-person interventions in swing states between now and the election. This is We Are the Art Partner for uh, March for Our Lives that you heard about earlier. 10 artists made 10 voter registration stations that we installed throughout the city. We'll be doing way more of those. Last but not least, here's where you can find us. And I'll drop them into the chat as well. Okay, sorry, thanks. Awesome, thanks so much, Yossi. Um, Nora. Hi everyone, I'm Nora Benavides. I am the director of US Free Expression Programs at PEN America. Um, I'm really excited to be here. You know, we are an organization at the nexus of literature and free expression. So I feel like we're marrying a lot of uh, Penn's own interests and constituents that we serve being here. I, in addition to being a lawyer and a movement lawyer uh, for many years, I also run PEN America's disinformation work. And so I wanted to give you guys just a little bit of a prelude of what we are doing this election season. We've been researching the effect of disinformation on communities and specifically around elections uh, for the last two elections, including our midterms in 2018 and in 2016. And this year, uh, we're gonna be ramping up doing work in a few ways. We, in early 2020, launched a media literacy and disinformation defense program, which equips voters and other members of the public with tools to identify disinformation and other forms of misleading content. And so in the lead up to the election, we're gonna be doing, uh, I'm gonna say five things, but I think we're doing more. One, we're gonna be launching a social media campaign on what voters can expect this election season, that results will be delayed, uh, there will be fertile ground for disinfo to thrive, among other things. We're working with voters, media partners, and librarians to educate them, and also to give educators and librarians tools to conduct their own workshops. We're also working with, on the media side, journalists and editors talking through what the tough calls will be and when they uh, re report on and call elections in concert with the AP. We're gonna be also spotlighting and focusing a lot on how BIPOC communities and Spanish language voters are targeted with disinformation campaigns from foreign to domestic uh, tactics. We're also producing a series of very short form guides on hotspots of disinformation. The newest that we released last week was about how to talk with friends and family who share misinformation. And it's the number one question we get actually in our work all the time, every time we do a workshop, a community session, a journalist panel, everything. And then we're also gonna be working with trusted voices in battleground cities and states. Uh, those are the radio hosts, the Spanish language, TV people, um, you know, pastors and other faith leaders, a pretty wide swath. We are focused on um, trying to elevate what we can to help voters actually identify disinformation, whether it's about the pandemic, even about protests, as well as the election itself, and uh, Your narrative two minutes discredit. Are Your two minutes okay, are Okay, so up. I'll put the link in um, the chat for you guys to learn more, and I'll also put my email. So thanks a lot. Great. Thanks so much, Nora. Appreciate it. Um, Joan Lipkin, Dance the Vote. Yes, hello everybody. Um, so I am talking to you from Missouri, and uh, it is a hotspot for misinformation and voter depression here. 
Four years ago, we started Dance the Vote, which is a St. Louis-based initiative that pairs spoken word, dance, music, graphics and videos to with voter advocacy and now also we're working on the census. With the pandemic, we have pivoted to a digital platform. And when George Floyd was murdered and, uh, the, uh, and We See You White American Theater Manifesto was out, we decided that although we'd always been racially mixed, that we would center our, <clears throat> no, excuse me, we would center our commissions largely on BIPOC choreographers to create videos about voting and other issues that concern them. Uh, we're doing a number of other things. We're co-hosting a 50 state, 50 day um, national dance party tomorrow. And I'm hoping Thomas can put that in the chat for us. Um, we just finished taping a bilingual video on the census and voter um, registration for the Latinx community. We're looking forward to doing this as well in the disability community. I'm very concerned that the arts community actually is kind of passive about these things. And so we're really making an effort to connect with the regional theaters. Um, I could mention many other things, but the last thing I'm gonna leave, leave with right now is to say that next week in partnership with Webster University, we will announce our collegiate competition for short, short videos in any media with cash awarded because we think it's important to pay people, right? To the extent that we can, but everybody's work will be available to stream and we're calling it Good Trouble, Why John Lewis Inspires Me to Vote. Did I hit the two minute mark? <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. That was stellar on time. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody for all things that are needed right now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so we've got Christina Wong uh, next and then Francis Valdez afterwards. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Wong. I'm a performance artist, comedian, and recently an elected representative in Koreatown um, as of last year. 72 votes, if you count the vote, I cast for myself for neighborhood council. So I had this show called Christina Wong for Public Office that was set to tour the country alongside real life rallies. And now I toured the show from my house. So that's, that's my kitchen. That's the area previously known as my kitchen. So in the research for doing this show, I learned that Asian Americans have the worst voter turnout at 40.2% in the 2018 election. We flunked voting. So what do we do about this? Um, because uh, I, I, my 42 year old butt can't quite influence the young. So I have a web series called Radical Cram School, which is not bipartisan, but I borrow from that humor in this series of videos that we're going to make um, uh, using H-Town Votes grant um, called Vote for the Future. And so we have Asian American kids, uh, we just shot yesterday, kids uh, having tantrums. Um, it, this is a thing, people like watching kids have tantrums. So it's a little scripted, but the kids are like, yeah, Rodney, my life, please vote. Oh my God, you're an embarrassment, please. So we think this is gonna do really well. I know it sounds crazy, but kids are weird and they like watching this kind of stuff. And then we have a, other videos where um, an older woman gets bombed by her younger self who shames her for not wanting to go out and vote. And then we will use a local cast from Houston to talk about, uh, to, to, to offer up all the adult reasons why, um, why adults don't vote, but, but said through kids. So we're hoping that this is engaging and kind of funny and weird. And that's what we're making. I can keep I can keep dancing for you, showing my house if I haven't gone past the two minutes. Let's yeah. see. I sewed all these. You have five seconds yeah. left. All right. Okay. <laughs> and my other group is Auntie Sewing Squad. I, I run Auntie a Sewing Squad. I, I run I, a I, mask yeah. making group. So thank you. Mwah. Much appreciated, Christina. Thank you for the enthusiasm. Um, Francis Valdez. <laughs> Hi, folks. Um, thanks so much. Uh, it's just so great to be around so many artists and creative people. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but in my former life, I played the oboe and I played my yaki music when I was in high school and college. So I think I really bring that into our work with Houston in Action and just want to say that I, with all the questions that I've seen, I just would really love to talk to anyone who's looking at how you bring artists and organizers and community um, engagement together. Something that I think was really great in our process that um, Art to Action helped us with was building relationship with artists as we, as a precursor to this work. 
as well as making sure and asking them what they needed. What, what I was really surprised to hear is how much artists wanted to learn about how to organize their community uh, for the things that they need. So that's something that we're also thinking about as well. And that's not just um, artists in service of the organizers. So um, I would love to connect with anyone who's doing that kind of work and continue to learn as we as I shared. We're really excited to be working with Christina and a bunch of other artists and to see what happens. This is an experiment for us. Um, but you know, I'm, ca I'm calling you from Houston, Texas. And if you watch the news, you know, Texas is a hot spot for so much. And so also a place for a lot of opportunity for us to be very creative and do something different. So don't ever um, discount us down in Texas. We have a lot of really great work and folks don't often know this that we are in Houston, the most diverse city in the country. And so getting people of color to vote and young people is essential for us because that's who we are and, and really making sure that we ensure that people of color lead with their arts and cultural practices to make sure that we can get folks engaged. So thank you so much. It was a wonderful um, presentation and look forward to staying in touch with you. Awesome. Thanks, Francis, repping Texas. Um, Dale, Dale Andre, uh, Dale Andre, and then Jamie McRae, Lex Lemire, and Sabra Williams. Hi. Um, if Jamie McRae is on, if she's here, she can also speak to this because we're together on Dance the Vote, which is um, not the same as Joan Lipkins, but we met because of this forum. So I thank you for that. We've already found a way to collaborate on what we're doing. Um, I'm director of National Water Dance, and I'm working with Jamie McRae on this uh, campaign, Dance the Vote. National Water Dance is um, a national organization that uses dance to bring attention to the environment, um, climate change, and water issues. It's a biannual site-specific simultaneous event that we live stream. But um, this campaign of Dance the Vote is going to be the week of um, September 22nd, which is, as we've already heard, National Voter Registration Day. And we're going to use the whole week to do a kind of ice bucket challenge by using movement to speak to why we're voting, which Sonia from Miami, Miami just spoke to, too. There's so many overlaps. And anyone can do it. Um, we're doing it through Instagram and through Facebook. And the idea is to use your own physical expression, a simple gesture as to why you're voting, and pass that on to someone else, as many people as you know. There'll be information through vote411.org um, on all the information you need for voting, but also we have um, National Voter Registration Day. Here is another link we can probably put up on there. So I hope you'll join us and participate. It's fun, but it's also very serious. As we all know, we have to get the vote out. Great, thank you. Um, Jamie, would you like to add something to that? Just wanna respect that you're also on this list. She might not have been able to make it. She was hoping to. Awesome, okay. So we've got Lex Lemire and, and uh, Sabra Williams. Lex? Maybe Lex is not here. Um, Sabra? Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm Sabra Williams. Uh, I am a woman of color wearing a black t-shirt against a bright blue background with my hair in a dark hair and a ponytail. Um, I run an organization called Creative Acts. Uh, we are a relatively new organization. I used to run and started an organization called the Actors Gang Prison Project. I've been working inside prisons for 15 years, bringing in arts programming. And at Creative Acts, um, we do really three programs. One is a crazy virtual reality re-entry program that we do on maximum security yards for lifers who are returning. But the two that you will probably be more interested in are our art attacks program in children's prisons in Los Angeles County where we uh, bring in an arts workshop. We're partners with March for Our Lives so that when our kids return, they can continue their civic engagement in the community with March for Our Lives. Mm -hmm. But we bring in an arts program. We started it in 2018 um, for the primary elections in 2018. And of the kids we worked with, 86% of them voted in a primary election who are incarcerated. <laughs> so we're doing it again for this election. Um, and uh, we hope to have a similar result, even though we're doing it on this craziness instead of in person. 
And then the other program we have is called Hashtag Party at the Polls, oh, where we ask artists to perform outside their polling stations to draw people to the polls and also to keep them in line to make sure that they vote. And it was super successful last time. It was only going to be in LA, but actually it ended up being across the country. So if any of you are interested in participating or know any artists who might be, please feel free um, to, uh, to reach out to us. And just so you know, um, our mission at Creative Acts is to transform, transform urgent social justice issues through the revolutionary power of the arts, to heal trauma, build community, raise power, and center the voices of those who are or have been incarcerated. So we're not teaching people how to be artists. We're using the power and the tools of the arts for people to be able to heal trauma and create, uh, make different behavioral choices and to create value in their communities. So um, please reach out. It's creativeacts.us, not .com, .us. And we would love to, um, oh, you know what? I just need to show you this because this is going to blow your mind. These are my kids in juvie. They've made these My Vote Is posters in 20 minutes inside. They're very beautiful. And uh, we're really fortunate to be able to bring these back outside. My Vote Is My Ancestor's Voice. So this is what they're doing inside Juvie, and they've all committed to vote by um, absentee ballot. So thank you. I'll put the website in the thing. Oh, someone did. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much for adding, for sharing that, um, both the story and the images as well. I appreciate that. Um, so we are right on time, just one minute over, which is phenomenal. That seldom happens in this world. I just, rather than taking questions, I want to create a few minutes for people to just think about the, any resource that you've come across that was eye-opening to you, that you found to be interesting, that you found really worked, that you found really sparked some curiosity or was smart or um, engaging in some way for any demographic, share that with us. Add it in the chat. It could be a project you've worked on. It could be a project your neighbor worked on, your colleague worked on, something you randomly came across on social media. We wanna see as much of that information as possible because we wanna share it back out with you all. Um, so take a minute, uh, share it in the chat. If, we, if it comes to you tonight, you can also just email it to us. Um, we'll make sure to get all this information back out your way. So, um, yeah, you know, we can't announce just yet what exactly is going on, but the net call, part two of this series of calls is taking place in early October. And that call will really focus on how movement building can support the call for people to become energized around election season. So um, we've got some really stellar speakers from the racial, environmental, and economic justice world who are ready to present on their platforms and all the different ways that they've been working to mobilize communities nationally across the country and build momentum towards election day. So hopefully you can join us. If you're on this list, you will um, get an email for that for part two. And this call will be recorded if you know of others who might be interested in this that weren't able to attend. Um, we'd love to see you. As a moment of closing, I would love for us to just, if everybody can unmute themselves and if you are able to let us see your video as well. I know having Zoom is so weird because there's all of these silent black boxes. Mm -hmm. um, but on three, I'd love for everybody to just shout, hooray, we got this. Beautiful. <laughs> One, two, we got this. We got this. We got it. We got it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please stay in touch. It's lovely to be a part of this community with you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you all. Sweet. I'm out. Bye.